Welcome everyone back to the Weekly Weather Podcast and in this week's podcast we're going to be having a look at why winter was so mild and snowless. We'll have a review of what the actual stats for winter were and then we'll have a look at the reasons why we didn't see really anything too cold and why it was generally quite mild and snowless. It's not an exact science by any means, but we'll be having a look at the evidence. Uh, that is one of the main reasons why really um, we did see these sort of conditions over the last three months. So remember, if you enjoy this podcast, make sure you do like and subscribe. And remember, if you are a channel member, you get to see the podcast early on Wednesday. I do want to first apologise, though. Uh, we have been podcastless for the last few weeks. Been a bit too busy to be getting them out, but hopefully we could get back a bit more consistency and get episodes out every single week. So if you have got suggestions, make sure you do get down in the comments below. But if we do first start in this podcast, have a look at some of the raw data. So we start by having a look at the Met Office CET. So if you look right at the bottom left of your screen, you can see all of the dates of the Met Office CET um, for each of the month, uh, or each of the seasons, sorry. It's really weirdly formatted only on the left side of the screen, but uh, I don't really know how to shift this a bit. But um, this is the date set straight from the Met Office CET website. And you can see all the years running back um, all the way to the mid 1600s for December, January, February, March, April, May, uh, June, July, August, September, October, November. So we're looking at the third, first column for winter, December, January, February. Now you can see the CET for winter 2021-22 came out as 5.9 degrees. Now if we do run it back over the last few years, you can see all the way back to sort of 2010-2011 we had some colder winters. You can see this has been a generally very mild winter compared to normal. Compared to the last five years, it's not too unusual. Last year was chilly, not cold, but chilly around average, especially during January uh, and below average, actually, for certain portions of, uh, of January. I think it was about minus, um, or was 0.8 degrees below average last January. But we've got CET of 4.4, but 2020, 6.2, had similar conditions to this winter with strong polar vortex and um, westerly winds. And then 2019, 5.9, 2018, 4.3, 5.4, 2017, 2016, very mild, 6.7. Uh, 2015 4.5 2014 6.1 you can see the pattern and if you do want to have a look at these data sets go into the met office ct website and you'll be able to have a look and download all of this data but generally it is a very mild winter 5.9 degrees um and you can look even back to last spring so march april may and remember may we can see mid to high 20s the, uh, not, uh, the CT was 7.9, so only 2 degrees warmer than the winter CT of this year. And last spring, yes, was pretty cold. We did see some very cold weather in March and April, proper cold northerly winds. Um, and, yeah, so this uh, winter wasn't too much colder than last spring. So, a bit of a mild winter. I'll have a look at some more stats in a minute. Have a look at sort of regional variabilities as well. But yeah, not been a great winter. And the reason why it's been so disappointing is because we did have very high hopes. In the winter updates we did throughout the autumn, we had high hopes looking at um, the stratosphere, at least initially, as the stratosphere was generally around average, if not a little bit weaker. For the first month or so in December, we had Eastly QBO. We had the ENSO regions going for us. And, of course, we have other things that not quite exact science, like solar minimum and stuff like that, which is a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of controversy over that, whether it does take into effect. But there is a correlation there, um, but not necessarily a causation. There is a correlation between solar minimum and perhaps more of, more blocking patterns. So, yeah, we were we did have high hopes, but unfortunately didn't really turn out uh, as we expected now if we also have a look at the ct these are for individual months um so you can see december january and february now december came out for ct with 6.4 degrees that's pretty mild um now december normally is actually the mildest month of winter um but you can see it is it was milder than uh winter uh, or tw uh, december 2020 
2018, sorry, 2017, and going back, it's around or above what we normally would see with 6.4. Pretty mild indeed. And you can see November only 0.9 degrees milder. Um, we did see cold weather in the end of November, and that gave us hope, really, for the winter. Um, as whenever we saw that cold weather with sort of Storm Arwen, which produced heavy snow quite widely in the north, for, um, uh, even in the end of November, we had high hopes uh, at that point in the winter, or end of autumn really there wasn't that much cold available air and if that sort of pattern had happened in december january february we would have seen much more widespread cold um and we had high hopes from that but you can see it didn't quite come off and you can see um as we head into january 4.6 degrees a bit chillier and we'll see why that is and it's got to do with the high pressure system we saw that stuck around for a couple weeks in the middle of january with a lot of frost and then february 6.8 very mild indeed one of the mildest Februarys we've had in quite a long time going back uh, all the way to till 2002 if i've read that correctly um mildest february for a long time while and of course we saw a lot of name storms with those three consecutive name storms that we saw with red warnings um as well for winds so real strengthening of the westerly winds there and you can see march and april 2021 7.2 and 6.4 and you can see february was 6.8 so our february was pretty much as cold as march and april was last year so it just shows you how mild this February has been, and actually how cold last March and April was. Even though March and April didn't produce anything am amazing or spectacular, it was cold, we saw quite a few wintry showers, a lot of overnight frost, and a lot of days where it only got up to sort of mid-single digits, and those temperatures plummeted overnight. Um, so, yeah, just shows you how unfortunate we have been this winter for anyone out there looking forward to some colder weather. So we do now have a look at some of the Met Office maps, have a look at actual values. Now, this is the winter 2022 mean temperature, the actual average temperature. So this is the CT, really, for each individual location, the average temperature. And you can see generally, as expected, southern England is going to be milder. Far southwest, the mildest area, with around 7 or 8 degrees actual value. Further northwards, of course, over the high ground, you can see trending more close towards freezing. And that's not too unexpected. But it's when we have a look at the anomalies. 1961 to 1990, you can see all areas are in the red, at least one to two degrees above the average, so not too good. Um, now, of course, this is 1961 to 1990, and notoriously that period was cold. Then now we have to admit that, regardless of your opinions with um, changing climate, undoubtedly that period was colder. We did have colder winters, um, so it is expected. We had a look at the 1981 to 2010 anomaly. You can see less darker reds, but still reds. And if we have a look at the newly updated 1991 to 2020, you can see most areas are 0.5 to 1 degree above. So it is even mild for sort of current day, really. So you can see it has been a widely milder than average winter, pretty much for all areas within the United Kingdom. Uh, it's not just one area dominating with mild weather. All areas generally are milder than average. So we do have a look at the rainfall amounts, because typically in a very mild winter, you'd expect massive rainfall amounts, because you'd expect a very active jet stream, big westerly winds. And we didn't see that widely, really. Now, of course, we saw named storms, but that was in short bursts, a week or two here or there. We didn't see the consistent westerly, flat westerly theme we saw in, for example, winter of 2019-2020, where we saw named storms, but generally loads of westerly winds. We did see our fair share of westerly winds, but we did have a lot of high pressure around. We did have a lot of hope for some blocking, but it never quite came off. Because at the end of the video, as I explained with the polar vortex, it kept flattening any amplification we tried to get, uh, keeping that high pressure over the top of the UK, if not to our south. Now you can see for the rainfall amount, you can see, um, if we actually go to the actual values, you can see, of course, further eastwards is going to be drier. That's just the nature of the UK. Over higher ground, further westwards, we're always going to see a more rainfall with a generally westerly prevailing wind. So not too unexpected. 
if we have a look at the 1961 to 1990 anomaly, you can see quite a decent distribution, really. Milder further eastwards and in the south, further northwards and westwards, a little uh, wetter than average. But nowhere massively wetter than average and nowhere massively drier than average. Just maybe t uh, 10 to 20% either way above or below average. 1981 to 2010 anomaly, very similar. And the 1991 to 2020 anomaly, again, very similar with that. So not too spectacular on rainfall amounts, which is a bit unusual for a mild winter, really. As, as I said, we'd expect quite a lot above average rainfall. Now, another surprising fact about this winter is air frosts. Now, with a milder than average winter, you wouldn't expect a significant number of air frosts. But as we'll see here, we actually did have quite a few. And you can see, actually, the bulk of the air frosts were in central England, um, surprisingly. Of course, further inland, we're always going to be seeing more air frosts. Of course, sea breezes keeping temperatures up further, further towards the coast. But you can see some areas in central England saw 20 air frosts, i.e. where the temperature got below freezing overnight. And as I said, it's because we had a lot of high pressure, a lot of an in, a lot of inversion patterns, especially through January, where you saw loads of frost in the day, uh, sorry, overnight, but in the day, temperatures got up to 9, 10 degrees, as we saw a lot of sunshine, and we didn't actually have that cold of upper air conditions. So we saw big variable temperatures, and the overall CTI, the average temperature of the day, was around average, uh, maybe slightly above average. But overnight, we did see a very sharp drop. If you look at the anomaly, 1961 to 1990, you can see below average across the north, which is expected with the high-pressure system centred further southwards, more of a westerly flow there, and slightly above average in central England and southern England. 1981 to 2010 anomaly, very similar. Less than average in the north, more than average in the south. Look at the 1991 to 2020 anomaly. Milder in the north in terms of air frost and colder in the south with more air frost. Maybe 5 to 10 more than average. So, yeah, very, very interesting seeing that. And that's all because of those inversion patterns we had at times with high pressure dominating, centering over the top of the UK. So, if we now have a look at the reasons why we saw these patterns. Above average temperatures generally around for the overall United Kingdom, um, rainfall amounts, and above average air frost in the south, below average further northwards. And it's all got to do, as ever, with our weather, with the jet stream, which in the winter is significantly affected by the stratospheric polar vortex. So we're going to have a look at the NAO, the AO, and we're going to have a look at the polar vortex charts um, to see why we're going to be seeing this. I would, if I... If, we had limited time, um, would have a look, sort of reanalysis at the pressure patterns, but perhaps I'll save that for another day. So if we do have a look at the AO, it goes all the way back to the middle of November. Now, if I do give a brief rundown, if anyone doesn't know what the AO and the NAO are, they're indexes showing the contrast between the general low pressure systems over the Arctic and the higher pressure systems towards the mid latitudes. Generally, we have high pressure centered over the Azores, and we generally have low pressure centered over the Arctic. Because of colder air over the Arctic, lower pressure, and lower densities, higher pressure over uh, the Azores with warmer air masses causing higher pressure, of course. So sort of simple physics. Uh, don't want to get into too complicated with it. So a positive AO means there is a stronger than average or stronger than normal pressure difference. So the low pressure of the Arctic and the high pressure towards the Azores, there is a stronger gradient, i.e. more likely to be a stronger westerly wind. Below zero, so negative AO and NAO, means there is a weaker than average temp uh, pressure contrast between low pressure so over the Arctic or the NAO in the North Atlantic and the higher pressure in the middle latitudes, i.e. the Azores or, or, and, the, and in the Atlantic in general. So for cold weather, we want a negative AO and negative NAO, meaning reduction in the strength of the low pressure over the Arctic and reduction in the strength of the Azores high, meaning more amplification, more snaking of that jet stream, meaning we're more likely to see inversions, um, cold inversions from the north or from the east with high pressure able to seep further northwards um, and it, it sort of infiltrate the general low pressure systems we normally see in the Greenland, in, over Greenland and the Arctic. Now that's a basic sort of over, overview of it. There's 
uh, it's more difficult to explain and it is probably easier to if we had a look at more examples but of course I don't want to make this too long and I have explained uh, this many times before so that's just a brief overview of it and you can see generally the AO, AO has been above zero the mean has been 0.65 for, for this period of the last four months or so you can see we did have a slight negative period towards the end of november and that coincided with storm arwin which produced snow in the north and the east and cold weather we also see a negative period towards middle of december into christmas period and that's where we saw those easterly winds get busted now, we did see a blocking pattern develop, but it didn't quite come off, uh, and that's unfortunate, and there was nothing we can do with that. It was looking so confident, and we saw a massive model flip. That was a period where we really did have high potential for cold weather, and it just didn't quite come off, unfortunately, um, from a number of different factors from the jet stream, kind of bringing up low pressure up from the south, and that block not quite being as strong as it needed to be if it was in that orientation, or if we could add it at its strength that it was, perhaps further eastwards, um, sort of giving us more of an easterly flow than a northerly flow so that cold air was so close to us it was all packed over um, towards iceland and scandinavia all between that area and the north atlantic was bitterly cold but it didn't it didn't quite get to the uk but after that you can see largely a positive ao now the ao and the nao are reflections of the atmosphere they don't drive anything they just show uh give a number really to what the atmosphere is doing it's the polar vortex that influences this and you can see generally it has remained fairly um blocked throughout the last few uh or last two months or so meaning generally westerly winds are very much favored and blocking patterns are very difficult to develop now if we have a look at the nao which is the north atlantic view you can see again has been above zero average around 0.3226 again end of november and mid-December coincided with those blocking patterns in the AAO. One difference is, as you can see, towards the Christmas period, the NAO actually goes towards more towards neutral, and that's what sort of screwed over that cold or easterly wind. The NAO had more low pressure gradient in it, jet stream slightly stronger than we wanted it to be or needed it to be to see cold weather, and it meant that we saw those low pressure systems start drive up from the south and the southwest, bringing milder air uh, in before that cold air could sort of establish itself. But beyond that, it has remained fairly strong. Now, you can see towards the middle of January, we actually did see weakening towards neutral. And that's where we had that blocking high over the top of the UK with the inversion, loads of overnight frosts. But it has generally been above zero, coinciding with a strong AO. That's why we saw a big stormy period in February with it, around one on the NAO scale. So, yeah, you can see why um, we have been very, very Wesley based. Have had some differences end of november middle of december middle of january with more high pressure over the top of the uk but never quite came off and the reason for that is the stratospheric polar vortex so we're going to finish the video by have a look at the stratospheric polar vortex now i'll have a brief uh, overview of what each of the lines mean if we just take off the forecast as, uh, as all the lines at the end are the forecast over the next few weeks remember we're looking back at the winter so at the moment not not too important to have a look at the current forecast but you can see the big yellow shading is what has happened to the polar vortex winds at 10 H hpa up in the atmosphere the average zone winds the westerly flow which powers most of um sort of the winds within our jet stream uh, with, with, well, within our atmosphere including the, the main jet stream which powers all the low pressure systems coming in from the west so all the, these are all these sort of wind speeds we've had, sometimes getting up towards 80 metres per second, other times getting down to negative 20 to 30 metres per second with a sudden stratospheric warming bringing in the winds from the east, meaning more blocking patterns, more northerly or easterly winds. Now you can see for most of this winter, or at least early on, it was around average. So maybe slightly above average through November and December, but then it just stayed around that real strong uh, area and even even strengthened when it should on average weaken you can see the black line is the general sort of mean stratospheric winds and you can see it peaks end of december early january and that's one of the reasons why sometimes we struggle to get cold weather in january uh, sorry in uh, end of december around the christmas period because of um the, the stratosphere is at its strongest so it's very difficult um to get uh the blocking patterns maintaining themselves unless of course we saw disruption to the stratosphere because it even strengthened when it should have been weakening 
Now you see the red dotted line, that is last winter's stratosphere. And you can see we saw a major sudden stratospheric warming at the start of January, and that's meant we had cold weather during January, and we had those easterly winds in early February, which weren't historic in terms of snow. Um, it didn't produce major amounts of snow, but it was very, very cold. We saw many days where temperatures were hovering around freezing, very cold overnight temperatures, and dew points getting down to sort of minus 15, real cold air mass. And that's all caused by the stratosphere. But you can see the opposite end this winter, it was around or uh, around sort of the record for a good period of time. And it's been all like that all the way to the end of March. And you can see in February to the start of March, it was as I said, ran record strength, and that's why we saw those um, those name storms with very strong uh, stratospheric winds powering it. But we see we had did have a warming recently, not a major sun stratospheric warming, but a major uh, sorry a stratospheric warming, not major. Um, and um, we haven't seen quite fully what that's going to be doing to the atmosphere yet, but it could mean we could see some high pressure returning. And we have seen that signal perhaps, uh, as we'll see with the forecast videos now, uh, over the next few days, of course. But it's now returning to around average and I expect it, if we do have a look at the uh, forecast from the GFS, to return well above average again, for hopefully it starts to decrease um, before we head into summer when it almost sort of diminishes completely and reverses to an easterly. So, you can see why we have had major stormy weather, but, as I said, we had other play, uh, other sort of climate drivers in our favour, like the ENSO, Eastly QBO, um, all favouring more of a blocked winter. And they did balance themselves out early in the winter, we did have potential in November, into December, but the stratosphere really took over, and caused this winter to be mild and snowless not particularly great and i know a lot of people out there are very disappointed i'm very disappointed as there was a lot of hope and potential but there is always next winter i guess um and for everyone out there who's maybe a little bit pessimistic coming off this winter considering the last few winters really have not been great at all we will once again see significant snow we will see a colder than average winter yes the general climate is warming, but we will see cold northerly or cold easterly winds. We will see periods where we go bitterly cold for days on end. It will happen again, whether it's next year or in a few years' time, it will happen again. So don't be too worried. Yes, unfortunately, the last few winters haven't been great. This winter has not been good if you're looking forward to any colder, snowier weather. But uh, all I can really say is there is hope for next winter. And of course... In about sort of six months' time, we'll be starting to have a look at um, winter updates for 2022-2023. But for now, we're looking forward to spring. Hopefully, we can start to see some warmer weather, um, as I'm a firm believer that we go from January, February, we want bitterly cold. As soon as we hit March, April, May, I want dry sunshine um, and generally warmer conditions so hopefully we see something like that over the next few weeks and we don't stay west uh, westerly uh, and we don't um, as a result of the stratospheric uh, warming we've had recently we don't go colder which is a poss uh, possibility but we'll have to see how that does play out the next few weeks but anyway thanks for watching hope you enjoyed subscribe if you're new and i'll see you again for another podcast or uh, another video um, next time